Chapter 20, Electromagnetic Induction. So I'm working through, uh, this is John Batista, College Physics, 5th edition. I'm, I'm doing just a bare basic summary, even though it can be a little complicated. Um, just, just what we really need, the, the bare minimum. You should still read the chapter. Okay. This one's kind of got a lot of beefy stuff in there, I'll tell you right now. That's the truth. Let's just jump right into it. And I'm going to do it the same way they do it. They start with this idea of, uh, they call it emotional EMF. And I always think of that as emotional EMF, but emotional EMF. So remember, EMF stands for electromotive force. It's really just a voltage, but it's a different way of saying that. So let's do this. Imagine that I have a bar, a metal bar, like that, and I'm moving with a velocity v that way. And there's a magnetic field in this region going into the paper, like that. That's b. That's v. So if you recall, charges experience a force when they're moving. F b, I'll call it F b, is equal to well, the magnitude, I'll just write the magnitude, QVB sine theta, and then we have to use the right-hand rule to find the direction of that force. In this metal, we have charges. So we have negative free electrons. There's an electron right there. There's one, and it's moving that way. So if that's the case, if I have a magnetic field going down and the velocity is that way, but it's negative charge, so QV is this way. If I do QV cross B, then that force, that charge is going to experience a force of QV. I'm trying to, I need my right, I did have my Lego piece thing. Oh, I broke it. Uh, QV is this way. Cross B, it's going to be a force this way. So this negative charge is going to get pushed down here. But if the negative charges get pushed down there, then positive charges are going to be left up there. They're, they're left alone because all the negatives move down there. This means that there's going to be, uh, this will happen until there's an electric field this way, E, inside of the wire, and the electric force balances this. So all the, not all the negative charges will move down here, just enough to make an electric field, and then it'll be in, state, it'll be in equilibrium. But now, if there's an electric field in there, remember that delta V, sorry, delta V, the change in electric potential is negative E delta R. So that means that there is a change in potential across here, an EMF going from this side to that side. So this has a length L. Then I can calculate uh, the strength of the electric field has to be such that it balances this. So it has to be QE has to be equal to QVB sine theta is zero. So E is equal to VB. So the change in potential EMF is VBL. So the faster I move this through there, the greater the change in potential. The greater the magnetic field, the greater the length, all those depend on the, the change in potential. And this is essentially one way to think about uh, how uh, electric generators work. It's not exactly. We're going to do a better example. But if I take this and hook it up to a light bulb, then those charges, those charges will keep moving through there, and I can keep generating current by pulling that through there. Now, there is a big difference, right? Because if I hook this up to a bulb, then I'll get an electric current in here. And so if there's a current, then I actually have to, there'll be a force on that bar and I have to pull it. And so it's not free energy, right? Because now I have to exert a force to pull it. If you don't have a, a wire, then the charges build up and it doesn't really care. And it's really kind of weird, but it's, it's important to realize that we're not getting anything for free. But that's motional EMF. It's a lot like the Hall effect. Uh, from the previous chapter, uh, detecting magnetic fields. Um, yeah, they give a thing about uh, the electric field, the the EMF due to a, a rotating generator, but I don't want to talk about that. 
Because it's just an equation and they don't really even explain it. I do want to talk about this most important thing. Magnetic flux. And we use the symbol capital Phi and we put a B there so it's not electric flux, it's magnetic flux. So flux is something that we use that's very important. And I like to think about this. Imagine that I have uh, like a plate and it's tilted some angle theta. And so this plate has an area A and it's raining like that. How much rain hits that? What's the rate that rain hits this plate? Well, it depends on a couple things. This is rain. It depends on the rain. It depends on the size of the plate and the area, the, the angle, right? If I, if I tilt that plate up, then I can get to the point where I have a plate like this and it's raining and none of the rain hits it. So it does, as I increase that angle, then I have less and less rain. Well, the same thing happens for magnetic fields. It turns out that to be it's very important to look at how much magnetic field crosses through some area, and that's what we call the flux. And we can calculate that as B A cosine theta. Now, I do want to point out that that's not really theta. If I'm looking at this from the side, here's my area, here's my magnetic field. Let's say it's this way. And we have, this is the angle that the line normal to the surface, it's the angle between this and that. That's theta, it's the angle between the normal. So if you have <clears throat> this and the magnetic field's coming straight down, that's theta of zero. This is theta of 90, okay? So we get the most flux when this is zero like that. And we get zero flux when it's like that. And and why why do we do that? Why why would you measure from the normal? Because measuring from uh this angle right here uh or measuring this angle is is not unique, right? Cuz it's a two-dimensional surface. So imagine I have a vector like this. Which where am I measuring the angle to? But if I have one vector for the for the area, we call it a normal vector, then it's much easier to do that. And that's why we do that. And this is magnetic flux. So it depends on the area, the area, the magnetic field, and the angle between them, just like rain flux does. And who cares about magnetic flux? Well, this is where it gets awesome. So it turns out that if I have a loop of wire with a magnetic field inside of it going into the board like this, there's flux. And, and everything's great. Nothing happens. But if I change the magnetic field or change the flux in any way, then I actually get an induced voltage around the loop, an EMF. And so this is the way the book writes it. They write EMF equals negative N delta phi B delta T. So that's the voltage around the loop. N is the number of loops Right? Because normally I could wrap a whole bunch of wires around here. I could do a thousand times and it would increase this factor by a thousand by every loop gets its own voltage. This is the change in flux. Change. Change is important. Per time. Change in time. I left off the E. We call this Faraday's Law. And the negative sign is not really working in this equation, but I'm going to tell you what it means anyway. The negative sign says that the EMF around this loop would create a current that would oppose the change. So if I increase this magnetic flux, then this would want to make a magnetic field that opposes that going this way. So if I use my right-hand rule, if, if B is increasing, then I would be this way. If B is decreasing, then I would be that way. Okay, because it wants to oppose the change. It wants to keep things the way they are. So it doesn't want to do that. And I could change the flux in any number of ways. I could change the, the magnetic field. 
I could change the area. If you take this and squish it, you decrease the area until you decrease the flux. Or I could change the angle. I could take that loop and rotate it. Right? Those would all change the flux. And why do we care? Well, this is a better way to explain how an electric generator works. Most generators create electrical current and power by rotating a coil in a magnetic field. And then the question is, how do you rotate? What makes that thing rotate? We often use steam, which seems silly, but it does work very well. And then how do you heat up the steam? Well, you could use a fossil fuel. You could burn a fossil fuel. You could use a nuclear reaction. You could use wind. You could use um, uh, falling water. Those are all the same thing. They all turn a coil of wire. It's kind of cool. Okay, there's a lot there. I've skipped over all the best applications. I want to talk about the applications there, but I'm just trying to give a summary. I said I was going to give a chapter summary. I didn't say I was going to give a giant lecture on all things physics, even though that's what I really want to do. Okay, here's something that's really important. Imagine that I have uh, a, a loop of wire, a bunch of loops of wire, but I'm just going to do, yeah, let's just do a bunch. It's a solenoid, so it's a cylinder with a with a coil wrapped around it. And it goes that way, like that. And I have an electric current flowing through there. This current is going to go through here and make a magnetic field. The magnetic, if it's going this way, uh, that magnetic field would be that way. And so that magnetic field is also going to be over here, passing through this coil of wire. Now, what if I increase the current? If I increase the current, that's going to increase the magnetic field, and that's going to increase the magnetic field over here. So uh, I increase is going to produce a flux, a changing flux that produces uh, an EMF. But that EMF is going to want to produce a current going the other way. So this is what we call an inductor. It's kind of a big deal, okay? Because if the current's constant, so for constant current, it's like it's not even there. It's just a plain wire. But for changing current, the faster the current changes, the greater the change in flux, the greater the induced electric, feet, electric current. For changing current, this makes an opposite voltage. So the whole inductor behaves as the current changes. So this, this makes a voltage change for a voltage for changing current. Now, if you remember, we had this other thing called a capacitor. This did the exact opposite. If you had a constant current, this built up and made a change in voltage. If you change the current back and forth, if I add and take off charge off this plate, it's like it's not even there. So these, these two things are opposite. The inductor and the capacitor are opposite, which is really great. They, ha they, make us, they, make, they allow us to do awesome things like oscillating circuits. And I'm not going to talk about those right now. We'll talk about those later, but it is kind of, kind of a big deal. Um, oh, they, they did talk about transformers. Um, I, I don't... They just given the transformer equation, so I don't really want to talk about that right now. We'll talk about transformers at some other point. Um, so I can calculate the change in the voltage across this EMF for an inductor as uh, negative L delta I delta T, where we call L the inductance. Just like uh, let's see, delta V equals, uh, Q, let's see, C is Q over V, yeah, Q over C. That's right, C is Q over, that's right, where that's the capacitance and that's the charge in the plate. So that, this is the current, the change in current, and that's the physical parameters of this coil of wire period the inductor. Uh, the other cool thing is that we already talked about the inductor making a constant magnetic field. Uh, so it turns out that because 
uh, I can change the current and it will make a voltage. I can store energy in an, an inductor. U equals one half L I squared. Because when you, if you have a large current going through this and you turn it off, you get an extra voltage. Where does that come from? It comes from the energy stored in there. And then if I consider that as energy stored in the magnetic field, I get this. Mu B is one over two mu epsilon naught B squared. And this is the energy density in the magnetic field. It's the energy per unit volume. And just a reminder, we had the same thing, mu naught, and I'm sorry, mu E is one over two epsilon naught E squared. That's the energy density for the electric field. So the electric and the magnetic field both have uh, energy stored in them, and that's kind of cool. Uh, they talk about an LR circuit, uh, but I'm going to save that for later. So the inductors and the L LRC circuits and all that stuff we'll look at in a future recording. But that's just the very basics of chapter 20. There's a bunch of great application stuff in there. I just didn't want to get into it all because it'd be a, a 89 minute video and I just didn't want to make that. So read the book. I'll post more videos of my favorite examples. Bye.